thank you, Fabio, for your great uh, presentation and education on on what it means to do business in Brazil and what we can do to uh, uh, build relationships down there. So, um, yeah, now Darcy and I are going to kind of go over some of the uh, pitfalls or, or or potential pitfalls that a lot that may, maybe many many of you have faced while trying to send product to Brazil or or, or anticipating that those pitfalls um, to come if you're if you're getting ready to do this. Um, we talked about the culture. Let's now talk about you know how we can create a seamless shipping process. So um, I do want to remind everyone that Brazil is tough to ship to, and uh, there's many reasons for that. But don't be dissuaded. Um, we have many experts not only here at Scarborough, but um, among our uh, uh, numerous agents that we that we deal with across the globe. We have some very very strong relationships with those agencies in Brazil to navigate those issues and as you know, items change, whether it be duty rates or requirements in regard to documentation or, or registration, we can, us and our partners in Brazil can help assist you in, in that process so you're not alone and not uh, facing fines or fees. Um, Darcy's here to, to help us uh, along that process as well. Darcy is a very uh, seasoned veteran in, in regards to Brazil and uh, she'll, she'll help us with that. Uh, the, one of the first things to, as the slide points out, one of the first things to, to keep in mind, um, both for importers and exporters, that you guys would have to register with the Foreign Trade Secretariat down in Brazil. Um, this is a lot like, um, the, the process ends up uh, resembling a lot like us in America getting an EIN number or a federal identification number uh, for tax purposes. Down there, it's a lot of the same same reasonings and same same procedures. You end up at the end getting what's called a CNPJ number um, for for your for your registration. Um, also, all Brazilian importers must have a Brazilian broker. So that means that all the U.S. shippers or foreign shippers uh, are not able to do what's called DDP Inco terms. And some of you may be familiar with that. If not, we'll kind of touch on that in a little bit here. But uh, it's not we're not able to. Uh, prepay or, or have a U.S. shipper be a importer of record in Brazil because uh, a Brazilian not only must they, must they be registered, but they also must have a Brazilian broker in Brazil. So we can work and help you guys. If, if you or your importer does, does not have a Brazilian broker they work with, um, our agents down there um, are great resources for that, and, and they can provide that service for you or can help, help you find other Brazilian brokers that would work with your products or your industry. Um, next slide. Um, next, we're going to talk kind of talk about some of the documentation, and Darcy is uh, well versed in this, and so I'm going to let her kind of start off the the uh, the requirements. Thanks, Chad. Um, as with almost every shipment that you send out of the country, we have to have a commercial invoice, a packing list. Um, Sometimes we have to have additional documentation or your clients may request additional documentation. For Brazil, we have to have originals. It's just a customs requirement. They aren't trying to be difficult. They just want originals. Um, as Chad mentioned, DDP is absolutely not allowed in Brazil and it is because of tax reasons. So if you agree to do a delivery or a door delivery with your client, the most you can do is a DAP. Um, that's as far as you're going to get to go. Um, as Kim is showing you the slide, you can see the most preferable is what she's highlighted in red with CIF. Um, that benefits both the seller and the buyer. Each side gets to control a little bit of the transportation process. Again, DDP is not going to happen. So if you have a client that is insisting on DDP, you need to back up just a little bit and ask them, you know, who is advising them that that can be done or why they are so insistent on doing it because Brazilian law prohibits it. Um, there are information that needs to be on the commercial invoice and the documents have to be consistent all the way through. So you have to have the shipper and the consignee be the same on both packing list, commercial invoice. Your INCO terms have to be clearly stated on your commercial invoice. We always also recommend that you take out cargo insurance. And it's 
for your own best interest as well as your customer's best interest. Nobody knows what's going to happen, and that is some additional uh, benefits just as you would have car insurance, you have health insurance, this is no different. You need cargo insurance. Um, a client that doesn't want cargo insurance, that's fine, um, but you can still take it out if you so wish. Um, a client may ask you for what we call a certificate of origin. We can issue those on your behalf without any additional fuss or difficulties. Um, bills of lading, are important because that's the transport document that moves it from your facility down to the customer's facility. Uh, Kim, can we go to the low lading slide, please? There we go. Um, there are some additional requirements on the bill of lading, and the NCM number may seem a little unfamiliar or kind of questioning, why do I need this? The NCM number counters or matches our harmonized tariff number or schedule B number. And maybe what is or isn't known is that the first six digits of the harmonized tariff are universal throughout the world. So it doesn't matter where you're shipping in the world, those first six digits are gonna be the same. The last four in the US are for statistical purposes. As far as Brazil is concerned, they only want the first four digits. That should be the same in their country as it is in our country. They may ask you to show a four digit that's within the same chapter, but the last two digits may be slightly different. That is acceptable. It's based on how they're going to classify it once it comes into their country. This is not an option. This is not if you feel like it. It has to be on that bill of lading or else you're going to have problems getting it cleared through Brazilian customs. So, and next slide, Kim. Thank you. The bills of lading, both the master and the house bill, have to be original and they will have to be rated. It is a Brazilian requirement. The original master bill of lading can be issued at destination, and that is a very common practice. Um, the bills of lading, like the commercial invoice and other documents, are signed in blue ink. And the reason it's blue ink is so that they can tell it is actually an original. If it's in black ink, it's too easy to consider it a forgery. Um, one of the last um, additional pieces of information that needs to go on the bill of lading is the ISPM 15 requirement. Some of you may or may not be familiar with that. That is in reference to wood packing material. Brazil signed on to that program just like the US did um, several years ago. Brazil signed on just a couple of years ago. That relates to wood coming in is considered to be pest free. And we all know that there are some unwanted bugs sometimes that end up in wood that if it isn't treated properly can do damage to the ecological environment for the destination countries. Um, that simply is just whether or not you have wood packing, if it's been treated and certified, if it's processed or it's not treated and not certified. It, we can figure that out or we ask those questions and those that information can be passed to us either through a shipper's letter of instruction or through an actual uh, certificate from the the company that provided the wood packing material. Uh, and if your customer has any other documentation requirements, just let us know and we can, you know, see if we can assist with it or, you know, find out, you know, specifically what they're looking for. Uh, additional documents sometimes are certificates of origin or they actually want uh, a certificate of insurance. Next slide, Kim. Again, we talked about that the bills of lading have to be rated. We cannot show as agreed. It's just not going to be accepted. If anyone is concerned that, well, I don't want my client seeing, you know, the rated bill, we are very, very careful with our partners, and that information is very confidential. It's only what is only needed to be passed along is passed along. So um, we try to make sure that everything matches from a freight standpoint 
to what's on the commercial invoice. Next slide, Kim. We talk about details that things must match across all documents, consignee name, CNPJ number. We also talk about that piece counts, description, port of loading, all of these things have to match. And we go through a, a strenuous check and balance process within the organization of Scarborough. If I have a shipment, I check it, then I have one of my colleagues check it. We then send the documents down to our Brazilian agent, they review it, and then they send the documents on to the consignee for them to review. It is always a good practice that before any exporter sends us their Brazilian documents, that they have already had the documents vetted by their customer in Brazil, so that by the time it gets to us, they should already know that the documents should be fine. We strenuously push that all of this be done well before the vessel sails, but no later than 24 hours before the vessel sails. If we do not have that done for some reason, you can imagine it is a very, very important reason why it's not been done. So, um, but again, we push very hard for everything to be done prior to sailing. Any discrepancies are resolved and handled and managed before we get to sailing. Once we have all the original documents, then we send them down and everything is there well in advance of the vessel arriving, which is very important for Brazil and a very helpful aspect for them to get it cleared timely. Kim, next slide. Again, documents have to be presented timely. If they are not, there can be serious fines and penalties assessed. And from my years of experience, I have seen Brazil impose some very stiff fines for inaccuracy in documents. Um, I think one of the last times I heard somebody incurred at least a $35,000 fine. And these are things that you cannot and do not want to incur in doing business in Brazil. It's, it's very important that you have a forwarder that understands the Brazilian market. You have a forwarder that has good contacts in Brazil with other forwarders that can provide good efficiencies and take care of potentially avoiding any discrepancies in your documents. Next slide, Kim. These are our major ocean ports in Brazil. The two primaries are Santos and Rio de Janeiro. The smaller ports, um, Fortaleza and Manaus, they're up in northern Brazil. We have Paranagua, Vitoria, and some of the other ones. They are smaller, um, but you can still reach them with most of the major carriers. Next one, Kim. The main airports are Garulas and Veracopas. We also can do Rio and Porto Alegre. You'll notice that Sao Paulo has two airports, passenger and cargo. Literally, Brazil prefers all of their cargo to run through Veracopas. It's much more efficient and more streamlined, and it keeps cargo away from passenger flights as well. Also, if we have freighter aircraft, it has to go into Veracopas. So, as some of you may or may not know, freighter aircraft do not run every day and they don't fly everywhere. So it's if that is something that's needed, we need a little extra time to make sure we can meet your needs and, and, and get you the service that you want. Next slide, Kim. Chad, yes. back to Great. you. Thank you for all the information. Um, that was very helpful. And, you know, we, we have a few questions. I want to be, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, um, we will go right until 2.30 um, and we will stick around and try to answer some questions for those that are able to stick around with us. If you have to leave, um, we will be able to put these um, onto our YouTube channel later so you can go back and listen to the questions that you missed if you have to uh, depart at 2.30. Um, we have a bunch of great questions from everyone both before the presentation started and even during. Um, I know uh, um, Fabio, Fabio has answered uh, some of the questions for us and I'll, I'll get to those um, by text here. Also, um, we're gonna run through some of the questions quick here. Uh, Fabio, can you give us kind of a little bit of a, 
uh, a breakdown of the Brazilian tax structure for um, as people are importing goods, what that looks like, or are taxes high, are they low? Give us a little bit of a snapshot of that if you can. Well, this is a little bit complicated. I don't want to bore, to bore everyone with uh, this, these details. So rule of thumb, if you consider like the average import duties is approximately 13%, that's the average. At the end of the day, your product is going to reach the, is going to leave customs costing approximately 80% above uh, the FOB price. Uh, this could be considered very, very high, but if you consider how local taxes are calculated, uh, the same product manufactured in Brazil is going to, let's say, leave the, the plant in Brazil for 100, uh, let's say, coins, and it's going to be sold for 150. So when you compare an imported good, it will leave the U.S. for 100, and then it will reach the final buyer for 180. So that's the 30% that I was talking about. So uh, our taxes are uh, on top of each other. So you calculate. So you have the the cost of shipping to Brazil, then you add the import duties, and then you start adding local taxes, and that multiplies and reaches 80%. So in a nutshell, that's how it works. But if you want to have the breakdown of each cost, then you have to go to a freight forwarder like Scarborough and then ask for details and uh, how. And the most important thing is, is not to make a mistake in how to uh, put the right uh, harmonized code to your product. And they are specialists in doing that because they have a local person here in Brazil. And uh, I, I always recommend to exporters that use companies that have a local agent operating in ports or airports in Brazil, because at the end of the day, that person is going to be responsible in clearing the goods. If they make a mistake, that's going to be on his or her shoulder to clear the product in, uh, in an efficient way. So if uh, this is really uh, not an easy game, so you have to rely on the right people for the right job. So that's why we always recommend to use experienced freight forwarders and companies that can clear the customs in an, in an efficient way without any hassle or any surprise to you or, or, or your clients. Uh, I see that many people uh, are looking at penalties and, uh, well, are, are, are thinking about the penalties that may be charged. And this is really uh, something very problematic that if you don't deal with companies like Scarborough, you may end up in trouble. All right, Th thank you, Fabio. Yeah, that's great. Um, Darcy, um, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. In regard to the, the certificate of insurance that you spoke about earlier, are telling everyone mm -hmm. that they should get insurance for their goods. Um, is it is it is the certificate of insurance specific to the order or or a particular shipment, or is it just an addition to the insurance that we carry with the carrier, so to speak? Is it? It's it's shipment specific, and it's in addition. To what you there's per se not insurance with the carrier. You have legal liability which is different. Um, if you don't have cargo insurance, the carrier will only pay you so much for your cargo and that's it. That's your only recourse. You could have half a million dollars in product and lose half a million. And if you don't have cargo insurance, the carrier will say, well, legal liability is all I'm, uh, that's all I owe you. And you'll get a fraction of what the cargo is actually worth. So cargo insurance is always strongly recommended. It is additional cost for the shipment, but it's it's a inexpensive amount considering what you're doing and where you're going and what it covers you for. Okay, great. Does that does that help? I think it does. Um, yeah, we had a couple couple folks ask that similar question, so I think that'll hopefully help them out. Um, okay. Hey, Fabio, I got one for you too now. Um, has customs become a friendlier structure for imports um, to Brazil? Um, have they, can you tell us more kind of even about um, 
some of the, the Brazilian strikes that have happened as well in, the, in that process? Well, this has been going on and off for several months. And um, this, in fact, doesn't affect the operations at ports and airports. They have been on strike. Uh, they want to have a, a pay increase in their salaries, and they keep going to the media saying, okay, we're on strike. But uh, they're always on strike, unfortunately. So, but it doesn't affect the operations. There, there could be like control delays here and there, but business is done as usual. So you, you may face a few days of delays here and there, but it's just a matter of having the right agent going to the custom official and explaining the situation. Okay, we have this cargo, it's urgent, it needs to, to leave uh, Sao Paulo and go to Rio and it has to be there in 24 hours. Can you do something? And uh, they, they, they can accommodate these, uh, these requests without any other major issue. So we know this is a problem. It goes to the media, but at the end of the day, everything is working uh, well. Not perfectly, but well. Okay. Uh, I got one more for you, Fabio. Um, I, some, someone asked, I'd like to know more about how uh, the supply chain security issues when shipping from U.S. from when shipping the U, shipping from the U.S. my product to Brazil um, is piracy or stolen goods an issue? Is that a, is that something that you that worry about in Brazil? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, both both sides, uh, exports from Brazil to the U.S. Uh, they have to be scanned, and and the same way. So there are restrictions. We have a very tight uh, surveillance, healthcare and agricultural surveillance on products. So this is this is really a big issue. And now that you raised this uh, the subject, it's very important. Recently, uh, last year, we had an embargo by European buyers of Brazilian beef or Brazilian beef and, and, and chicken, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, uh, it took a while until they cleared all the aspects. And now another problem has been raised by the, the Brazilian Federal Police. And very likely this will create an impact on exports of protein from Brazil to other countries. So that's something that uh, one in this industry should be aware of and uh, take a careful look because the, the largest exporters of protein are somewhat involved. They are going through, a, a, let's say, a, a fight about the control of the company. And this is a multi-billion dollar company. And apparently uh, they are leaking some bad information and uh, that was uh, found, the, the information, the bad information was found to be true by the federal police. So this is uh, really critical. So for importers of protein from Brazil, they should be watching this very closely. Okay, great. Um, that's even, as you talked, that's even, it was even more resonating in my mind, another reason to, uh, to pick up uh, insurance for my cargo that way. <laughs> I can protect it against a lot of those things. Um, I, another question we have is, uh, are exports from Brazil to the US um, as complex or detailed as, as it is from the US to Brazil? Would you say that, Fabio, or was that would? I think Darcy can answer that better. Okay, Darcy, great. Darcy, you want to take it to <laughs> that? Um. So an export from Brazil into the U.S.? Yeah, they're they're basically asking, um, is it as detailed in in our from our point of view? I mean, it would be a no and to that because it's not as the the regulations that we face on the export side from the U.S. to Brazil um, we see is a lot higher than the than the, than the uh, restrictions or or guidelines that the U.S. puts on any goods that are importing into the U.S. Exactly. Yeah, I would think that if, you know, the question, I would think one of our, our imports, uh, exports, or import experts would be, you know, better qualified to ask, you know, fully explain that uh, question or the, respond to that question. And we can have one of them, you know, contact the individual that asked the question just to, you know, further clarify 
if yes. there was something specific about what they were exporting out of Brazil into the U.S. Um, I think one of our import team members might be able to ask, answer that a little bit more thoroughly. Sure. And one thing to keep in mind for all those people who are importing uh, to the U.S. from Brazil, uh, currently there are no embargoes with Brazil. That means that there won't be any uh, restrictions when you're bringing that stuff any more so than there would be um, into, into Brazil. You will have actually uh, the same amount of freedoms uh, to import into the U.S. out of Brazil. So, but yes, we can we can definitely have our import team address that as well uh, after the after the webinar. We can send an email to those people that ask that. Um, Darcy, I know you you touched a lot on uh, documentary and stuff. Do you know of any um, import licenses that are required to go into Brazil um, when you're exporting out of the U.S.? Are there any import licenses that are required? Um, and if so, if, you're con if the cargo does not fit into um, a particular container size, do you have to get multiple licenses per container, or is that one license good for all uh, the, the entire shipment size? The Brazilian buyer most likely is going to have an import license. The seller, the exporter out of the U.S., is not likely to have a license requirement, but most licenses are for a specific quantity of product, not a specific number of containers. And they're usually valid for a period of time. Uh, so you could have multiple shipments be covered under one import license. It's a matter of how long it takes you to get that quantity met on the import license. You'll still have the documentary requirements that have to be met as far as commercial invoice packing list if there's any need for a certificate of origin, if there's a need for the insurance certificate, those will all have to be issued accordingly and then sent to the the Brazilian broker on behalf of the consignee. So yeah, the import license requirements, it shouldn't be based on number of containers. It's specific to the amount of product. Okay, great. That's so if it so if it takes one container, great. If it takes 100 containers, let us know, because we'll probably want to be in on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so we have, a, we have a ton of questions, and we're kind of running out of time here, so I apologize. We, we'll be able to get to a lot of these other questions by emailing, you, emailing out directly to the, to the, uh, to the question askers. Um, and just a reminder to all those people that are listening and watching, um, we will have this on our YouTube channel later on. So you'll be able to rewatch this or uh, write down any notes that you may have missed as we were going over this. Um, Darcy, you got the last question here. Um, are there any documents that need to be sent to the consulate to be uh, legalized or consularized? No, not with Brazil. Um, as a general rule, shipments that are not covered by a letter of credit do not, requ try, do not require any type of legalization or consularization. Um, and generally, even shipments covered under a letter of credit don't require that either. So it's, if it happens, it's an extreme situation, and it's rare. Okay. But as, as a general rule, no, it does not. Well, that's good to know. Um, sometimes that process can, can be quite costly and uh, labor-intensive to do, so it's a one less hoop to jump through for Brazil. So. Yep. Um, well, great. I just want to thank everyone for uh, attending and letting us uh, um, hopefully provide information to all of you that uh, maybe you didn't know before or maybe it was just reinforced if you did know it before. So uh, um, if you have any other questions that, uh, like I said, that we didn't get answered or if we don't get back to you by email, definitely shoot us another email um, or call us and we will get those answers for you. We always want to be um, a wealth of knowledge for you, even after the fact, so uh, don't hesitate to get in contact with us. Um, but like we said, any, any unanswered questions that we're able to uh, get to, we will shoot those answers out by, by email afterwards. Um, thank you so much, and you guys have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.